pomeriggio, un saluto. Good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome to everyone who's here with us uh, in person and everyone who's following online and on who will see us hopefully later on YouTube. This year's been one of, of balance and of looking to the future as if we'd come, everything had kind of come together for all of us, the moment to judge the first two decades of this century and to understand what's awaiting us in the, the 2020s that we've just started to explore. The pandemic probably, like we've said many times in many of the uh, encounters we've had at the meeting, has been the kind of what's driven us to understand how we've lived uh, our lives it's intensely both from top to bottom in the last 20 years and another tragedy uh, recently like Afghanistan has pushed us to look to geopolitical choices of this period the choices made by the West especially looking to uh, with the anniversary of 9-11 coming soon so don't worry you haven't come to the wrong uh, the wrong meeting here I'm talking about geopolitics because in these 20 years, in a parallel fashion, often well integrated in a way to condition events, a lot has changed, everything has changed, even in the world of communications, of technology, of information. Let's say that this chain, this epochal change of the, the digital system in which we're immersed has accompanied often and determined many of the phenomena that we are living right now. You know, in this very, very strange era. Uh, it's only just started though. At the beginning of the millennium, you know, and who's, anyone who's a little bit older will remember, there was widespread trust in technology. Digital technology was seen as a, so a, a, a way to empower other factors, to, to push forwards our society. And we saw it as something that would definitely have accelerated many things, politics, the economy, and many other phenomena. You remember Google, it, one among its first years, it, had a, it took its motto as, don't be evil. Social media in their first few years, we talk about kind of 2006, 2008, the first era of social media, we saw them as, uh, as protagonists, as, uh, as drivers of great change, of great revolution. We think of the Arab Spring, of uh, Obama's election campaign. So it's undeniable that all of this happened, but something has, something's broken, something had changed, or that um, uh, with the, the coming of the years, something that was already there has come to light something that at the beginning of these 20 years we hadn't really understood properly. So the discussion we'd like to have today, and now I'll uh, introduce all our, our guests today, those who are going to speak with us on these topics, it's going to be an attempt to try and understand what can we learn from these first 20 years, and how can we look to the 2020s, to the coming decade, how can we educate ourselves to to look at future years have with possibilities ahead of us of a use of the of the web that that's different or that can have slightly different uh, characteristics compared to what's happened in the most recent years and that will allow us it, you know it would be nice let's see if uh, our guests agree with me to kind of recover some of the positivity around technology that there was at the beginning of this, uh, this era that we're living through now. And how the digital revolution can in the next years be a, a partner in this journey with us. Of this, uh, this very long, the long uh, course of humanity. And I don't know if it's been your experience, but to be, to be seen maybe less... Uh, with fear as we have seen as many of our most recent issues. So we have a, a stellar quartet of, uh, of guests here to deal with uh, this journey here. I'll start with Roberta Cocco, who's the Councillor for Digital Transformation and Civic Services of the Municipality of Milan, and who's also 
which is also something we'll talk about later in the world of media and of uh, social media platforms and IT that's allowed her to be a, a great observer of these phenomena as uh, in fact she even teaches at the university level so hello everyone and thank you for the invite uh, joining us from I don't know where in the world but uh, he's off here in Italy now it's the summer period and uh, we've got prof Professor Derek de Kirikov, a sociologist an academic and academic and scientific director of the digital magazine Media 2000 who's a, an expert on many of these uh, issues in Italy and in the world uh, and he's been uh, observing these um, these phenomena for a while one of you know he's one of the students of Marshall McLuhan thank you it's very important to, to, for me to be here and here on the stage with me is Enrico Gentina coordinator of Civiltà Digitale and organizer of TEDx Torino and of many other things he'll tell us about shortly welcome And finally, Massimo Russo, who's the director of Esquire Italia and the chief product officer Europe of the Hearst Group, with a, a long history in the editing world, in the edi editorial world. He worked with the Gruppo Jedi and many other things. He's a that's kind of where we met each other. He's a few years ago, and for years now, he's been uh, able to observe these phenomena that. Uh, he's got a lot of uh, great experience of that either he'll tell you or I will that's very useful as part of this journey. Welcome Massimo. So I would start by asking Professor de Kirchhoff to, to give us the first insight into the reflections we're having here and so to help us so help us Professor what's happened in these last 20 years admitting that if, if you agree and what what are the the criteria or what the, the criticisms that you've seen occur in this very rapid digital transformation in the past 20 years and after this you know we might try and uh, venture into the 2020s but to start let's look at the the years that have just passed so it's something a bit uh, upsetting, disappointing, because at the end of the coming of the millennium, people had a lot of faith in uh, in culture and digital culture. Now we come here and we're in these last twenty years. We're always, we're kind of getting into a, a crisis now, a pist an epistemological crisis, you could call it, in the sense that. It's a culture that, uh, for years, people have. We've lived a new kind of style of communication. It's completely revolutionary, and part of a new kind of digital culture that has transformed our society. These digital transformations is a kind of a very provocative way to say this, but it's a way to eliminate the sense of com human communication or if not of human c communication itself then that of uh, kind of more mechanical communication Th the point of digital transformations it doesn't need this sense to uh, affect its own let's call it progress in the, in our culture let's think about automatic translation about Google Translate or Deeple or all of these the amazing thing is that you can translate from so many languages without needing uh, Google or Deeple to, to know any of them you know the digital transformation doesn't make sense it's it doesn't have a, a consciousness it's not self-aware and it, you know it's but yet it's indispensable to us it's able of uh, you know, affecting change that controls the whole world, and this is something that's kind of difficult to, to see to admit in the West. Because why do us Westerners 
still uh, see that the I is part of our nature. It's part of, let's call it, of this gift. So in fact, it's a, it's a, it's a cultural product. The, the I is born from this kind of writing. I wanted to uh, make some points how this I was born. The I comes from the fact that the Greek alphabet and then the Roman one was able to completely translate uh, oral language. It inserted into it and in the moment in which people began to, to read and to write more, but especially to read in silence, uh, this language was internalized. People internalized the, their own knowledge and at the same time they internalized these uh, kind of new ways of thinking and uh, new ways of mental structure. And we should think that many theatres in Greece, in ancient Greece that is, and even in Italy, that they became chi they became uh, churches in the end, and became a it kind of turned into a mo new model for spectators. You who are sat here, you've you've also got this this new model. You're facing it now as a way to. Uh, have internalized a new consciousness but as a almost like a different kind of simulation of the world we face now and the the speed and of uh, of thinking and of the personalization even of thinking has been promoted recently the true issue nowadays that this uh, as that this creativity has been driven by this uh, these new ways of thinking in the west think about theater the problem now is that digital culture invades this uh, invades this you know it, this intimate space these these eyes that usually uh, refer to our cognitive functions our memory our intelligence now it's uh, overriding all of this it's being put in it's been uh, all placed into our mobile phones. We're being emptied of our own cognitive functions that we've uh, we took for granted, and we still do. This I. So I know I'm answering in a I'm answering in a, a long-winded way, but I I'm uh, subscribed to an old way of thinking that of Ignatius of Loyola. The Jesuits uh, invented this, the perfect way of teaching the alphabet. Loyola and his group of, uh, of advisors perfectly understood how they could launch this, uh, this great mental help that was the alphabet. And uh, his Ratio Studiorum, his plan of studies, was an educational model that even today continues to be the the central uh, pillar of many schools of modern schools of thought the problem is thinking that since it's, the alphabet isn't no longer something that uh, dominates our culture instead it's it's something digital we ask ourselves when will this kind of let's call it the jesuit order 2.0 to educate what we could call Pinocchio 2.0, which is us, the next iteration. Let's remember, Pinocchio was a was an anthropomorphic. Uh, it was a machine, basically. And these things were mechanized like that back in the day. Now the the model is a, a, digi a digital Geppetto. It's a a totally how can I put it, digital structure of understanding and the idea of a, of a waiting for waiting a, a truly an education truly founded on this uh, of, of, of history teaching it up to university to understand perfectly this kind of cultural model that focuses on our on our minds it's something for me that that you can enter into a, a future of maintaining something that uh, reflects this eye. I'd say one more thing. 
reading on a reading a book isn't the same as reading on a tablet. I want to I want to protect this because Uh, there's uh, there's few places where a language is fixed and is made immobile. The only place where you are, let's say, the the master of of words, is when this word is fixed, is when it's written. Once it's moved, it's no longer inside you; it's outside. And at this point, uh, it takes possession; it controls you. To protect the eye, we talk about it. We've spoken a lot about it. I recommend to a uh, do what I call mental gymnastics to continue to read on paper without uh, obviously abandon, we don't need to abandon our schemes and sorry to, for being so long, this is kind of taunted to I say uh, this is uh, certainly provoking for those who come from the editing world like uh, like I do to, that we shouldn't forget paper in this new digital world I'll uh, I'll take note from this. Well, let's let's be inspired by these very these provoking statements. We should deepen with from uh, Professor De Kerkov. We need this kind of 2.0 Jesuit approach for us, the Pino the 2.0 Pinocchios of the modern world, and that our eye is so launched into the digital world. Uh, let's move to uh, Enrico Gentina to ask him in his experience, and maybe in two words his experience uh, how does the digital space in this year how has it changed our way of teaching of educating of communicating and like professor kirkov said how the how has it made this kind of relationship easier or less uh, un milione di dollari this is a million dollar question and uh, of course in this moment, everybody has has a personal experience about how digital and social media has invaded our uh, our lives. What we're doing now is to try and reflect on this uh, um, digital civilization to see how we can raise awareness and consciousness about how to use digital uh, um, digital media. Of course, this is not just a question of uh, learning how to use computers, but it has to do with uh, the awareness with which we use uh, digital uh, the, the, the digital world in our lives. What we were talking about there, there's a very important point that I'd like to point out. For the first time, we see in history, in human history, uh, those who are have more skills, uh, who are uh, digital natives, we could say, are not uh, the same people that are able to teach these digital skills. So there's a huge difference between teachers, uh, teachers in school, who are recognized as such in, in their role as teachers, and uh, students. We see it every day uh, through teachers. Well, if you send me an email, uh, make sure you also send me a text message, because I never open my email. And now it has become quite normal. We wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't answer uh, an email after five minutes. But if we don't answer a text message, uh, you might get a phone call saying, "Why didn't you answer my text?" We live in a world where we have a coexistence between uh, people who have very different skills and habits surrounding. Uh, digital appliances. So we'd like to um, fill this gap between the gap between students and teachers in the classroom by helping with uh, guides to, to guide these teachers, um, to guide 
young people and students and to help them prepare and give them more skills to make them have someone in front of them who's no, who knows more about digital media than they do themselves. This should become a daily thing. The question is, how do we do this? We uh, have has we've had the opportunity with uh, Civita Digitale, Digital Civilization, to chat with some young parents or um, parents of very young children, and many are very attentive. They're quite scared too. Of course, if someone gave us the instruments to explain what a, a, our digital society was, what digital society is, we'd be very, very curious. Where do we find these instruments? Of course, a small child who's starting to go to school, uh, the parents might say, I hope that our teacher, that teacher, might help us to accompany our child. And this is the challenge right now, today. So with the testimony of Enrica Gentina, we have an experience uh, from the battlefield about how, what we should do. We talk about giving back uh, regarding those who um, are in the digital sphere. But at the same time, we, s we think about giving forward to give those to are, uh, have, need skills in order to um, get used to living in such a new world. I'd like to uh, call into play uh, Roberta Cocco's uh, contribution. Uh, she lived these transformations personally, firstly in Microsoft, in, in a managerial position, and then in the battlefield, in very important digital uh, areas in Milan, such as uh, insofar as councillor and digital transformation for digital transformation and civic services of the munic municipality of Milan. I wanted to ask, how did you live this transformation of these 20 years, um, considering everything that has happened in the last, uh, in past times, and comment if you can on what has already emerged. So. Yes, this is very, very interesting, what has come up so far. Uh, so these 20 years, while we have been in this digital era, while we have lived through this digital era, we have seen a huge, a complete transformation in this uh, digital sphere. If I think about where I was in 2000, when I was in Microsoft, with all the sub the subsidiaries, and we looked at how all the computers were changing, and we expected that everything would change, we opened our champagne, and thankfully we all went home because the technology wasn't as disastrous as we had imagined. The world has changed radically. The last year and a half with this terrible pandemic, it has completely, it has taught us so much regarding how we perceive this new world which is changing, moving, and for the first time, we have perhaps underestimated its various interpretations. So first of all, going back to your introduction, the theme, the topic of education. I wanted to become a civil servant, in other words, to serve my city, giving the skills. And I had the privilege to do so in my previous uh, professional experience. But uh, since 
if somebody had told me in February 2020 that we would have been able to reach all citizens, giving them indications, information, and making schools incapable uh, capable of distance learning. Even though with all its problems and complications, it still became a reality. I would have thought that they would they were telling me lies, that they were joking. But I saw many cities, many public administrations that have used uh, digital media to do the following, to be to used as an instrument, used well, I would say very well, how this digital uh, world can actually reach people offer services, allow for a dialogue. Thanks to the digital sphere, we have been able to continue to work. It's thanks to this. We have been able to reach the most weak, the weakest in our society. The, the world of school, the, we haven't lost touch with the students. I would, uh, looking forward in the next 20 years, I would collect this heritage and make it the basis for a new rebuilding of our society. Another point that you said there, Marco, was about the relationship between adults and young people. Young people, apart from being uh, digital natives and amongst these, I also count my children. They are objectively more prepared than we are and more prepared than m our parents. So in this situation, there is a huge need for their contribution in order for all this, these skills reach everybody, all this information reach everybody. It would be beautiful to build this together starting from young people that they can help, of course, considering their age, uh, and help the people that for their age, their uh, social class, don't have these skills. We have the duty to use technology. We have the duty to teach uh, young people to use technology, however. We need to talk about a new uh, digital humanism. And going back to what De Kerkove said, artificial intelligence doesn't make sense. It's, it has no consciousness. That's true. Sequences, binary systems, man, it is the human being that can make the difference. And this is our duty as adults to accompany our young people so that they, from this knowledge, this osmosis of knowledge, we can um, contribute to each other in a helpful way. In our city, we were completely overwhelmed to see how our citizens, even the oldest ones amongst us, uh, received our communications, our uh, information, downloaded all the leaflets, they followed instructions in, in a time when we had made the effort to make all of this accessible. And now, um, we have we have reached up to 90% of um, identity documents uh, downloaded from our city and this is incredible this osmosis we could say of digital knowledge and the sharing of this knowledge i think is i think it is all this is fundamental and i think our group our uh, goal is to help us to use all this in order to look forward and build our new society thank you uh, you reminded me uh, of the year 2000 uh, our new year when we uh, celebrated the new year the new millennium and we were expecting the catastrophe of the world uh, I look about uh, on that memory with uh, humor so 
all these things that we're talking about, I'd like to point out, highlight, uh, highlight the things that continue to um, scare us uh, in this uh, age of transformation. In these last 20 years, what have you seen? Uh, how would you describe this age of transformation? Danny. So in this last very digital age, you know, if we hadn't had it, then we wouldn't be here today because we wouldn't have had vaccines. Vaccines uh, were, were allowed to develop them because of this, uh, this uh, the capacity of the scientific community now, let's talk about Pfizer and Moderna, to communicate globally that uh, allowed us to, in very very rapidly to to communicate and to uh, and to allow these uh, these new vaccines to materialize and so we also wouldn't have been here because the the system that uh, that permits test and trace now and to, to all be in the same room uh, today all and everyone connected online without the digital world none of this would have existed so let's just start by bearing in mind things that would suddenly disappear from our lives. Let's imagine if uh, we went back to the beginning, to, middle, to the mid-90s one morning. What you're saying is true. Um, there's always a, a, f a time of fear, which is tied to, it's part of our nature, you know. People are made to uh, understand danger Than to, to 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 fear more than to process rationally, because that's uh, that saved us a lot in our history. You know, from the tiger who tried to eat us in the wild, or from uh, any other event like this. So when some some events or phenomena that are so so strange in uh, the evolution of the human race, uh, Professor Derkerkov referred first to the. Um, to how the digital world is a, a new, completely new form of language, and I think that uh, to find some analogies to what's happening nowadays, perhaps we should look at um, the uh, invention of uh, mobile characters after the Industrial Revolution, with and some. There are some Im immense uh, changes like that. That uh, let me talk, tell you an example. That first, you attend. There's an immediate novelty. Then this immediate novelty maybe isn't quite how we expect it. There's a, a sense of dil uh, disillusionment. But these uh, these films are still work in the background. That in eventually we only see the consequence of of. Uh, Centuries later, if we think about the invention of the printing press uh, by Gutenberg, uh, a result of that was the the Reformation, because people were able to print their own Bibles and didn't need to go um, to church anymore. Or the Thirty Years' War, and uh, historians are, con agree a lot on this, is the, the distribution of pamphlets um, because of the printing press pushed the, the Thirty Years' War to happen. So... The results in the Industrial Revolution are all phenomena that, in this period, produce a series of uh, often, and often people who are people can discharge people who are who benefit from it can uh, offload the charge it, the the costs onto others, but it allows people to be understood deeply. In the you know in the last twenty years, people who've known to make the most of the opportunities uh, permitted by this this uh, new world has made some enormous uh, steps forwards innovation drives uh, the development of the human race now if if we aren't so if there we look at some indicators now that are like uh, the list of the the FTSE 100 companies or the Dow Jones, I mean, we, if we looked at that list in 2001 and we looked at them now, we saw half of them that were there in 2001 are not there anymore. 52% have disappeared, have failed, substituted greatly by, uh, by and large, by companies which at the time didn't exist either. So if we look at some standards for the, uh, 
the FTSE 500 that uh, measures uh, these different companies. At the top five companies of this ranking, they definitely capitalize uh, on the stock market. They produce more money uh, than of France and Germany's GDP combined. So it's evident that there's something that something mind-blowing has happened. That us today and here we uh, we enter into the effect of these these uh, macro phenomena on all of us. We tend to see only the the fear, only what we're afraid of, things that provoke uh, a, a fear in our lives. And as much as we like to th we'd like to think differently, people are definitely, like Bernard Schultz said, humans are our uh, own. We fear change. Bernard Schultz said the only uh, beings that like change are uh, are wet children. He said. So we always na we naturally tend towards uh, considering how unacceptable, how unacceptable or never before seen what happening, what's the, the events happening nowadays are. We see on, so we often talk about social media and I don't want to uh, to wait, uh, to give any less weight to the issues of algorithms or or of technology in that sense. We often talk about social media as something that in one way they're the, the, the driver of this, the fact that this is the most divisive age that we've ever seen definitely in our recent history in Europe you know in the 70s people would shoot each other uh, were shot by terrorists and uh, in Italy in Germany in Spain uh, because of ETA or in, even in England because of the IRA and now this seems that in some way we, we don't see it anymore it's as if the the, the past this immense this immense nostalgia which is the only uh, sentiment that will we should never let let go the nostalgia for something that existed before in some way it makes us think that what happened but came before us was a kind of garden of eden a, a, a pure place oh, it's definitely that's not the case and i think now both uh, in terms of ourselves and institutions we should have we have a lot to learn if we started to think to reason properly thinking to satisfy our collective needs and the needs of individual people using the opportunities of this new age like how those uh, economic giants learn how to use them too they were able to see trends or things that institutions and communities were not able to pick up on so, Professor de, de Kerkov, something uh, immense has happened, like Massimo Rossi said. We'd like you to help us without, you know, we don't ha without having to be a futurologist to read the future. So, what what can we expect in the in the twenties, in the nineteen, in the new twenty twenties? What uh, what are your predictions of what lies ahead? You were talking about AI and of your your worries of uh, of issues that rise from that. Well, how do you, what do you think how do you think we should face these phenomena in order to leave the next twi uh, the next years uh, harnessing everything that's great that's going to happen without letting us be consumed by fear? So this is a good question. So I I follow the 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 idea that technology creates its own image they create their own ethics and we say one of the the great discoveries that was made recently it's talking about how the arrival of the alphabet in Greece and in Rome because it makes itself known you know, first it was a, a god of the people which means now that an ethics comes from this relationship is now becomes one with your own god so this is you know it was probable but i think that technology digital technology has its own ethics tied to it but we don't know it uh the chinese have done it in a very interesting way that is that they can uh, they control everything because when you invade people's privacy and it's a 
you know, it's very, it's very open. You know, we're almost naked in the street. People's ethics uh, should be, should or agree with this change, or uh, we should oppose it. The Chinese, the Chinese have invented social credit, which uh, it's imposes a way of uh, of moral and ethic social behavior, because the uh, the Chinese have very communitary culture. Us with our eye, we've invented a personal culture instead in the West, an individualist culture which has created its own ethics and certain values which are fundamental and continue to be practiced. But we should also make a compromise with this new this uh, new dimension that we need to we need to have a more far more awareness for the community as a whole. So now we're in our epistemological crisis, like I called it earlier. It just expresses itself with fake news, with uh, all these things that people can invent the truth however they like it. But now the the situation is so is such that uh, people who who have no idea what they're talking about and uh, who don't know what they don't know the facts, they can uh, propagate fake news. Uh, conspiracy theories freely. We need to, you know, these are uh, these what I call Jesuit 2.0. They need to teach this kind of online ethics. It needs to be uh, pushed as widely as possible. You know, as you call, uh, I, I don't, I agree that I don't really like the term uh, digi digital natives, but we need to teach young people how that. Uh, Ethics online are kind of a form of survival. It's not just a question of uh, of being polite. It's that that the, the habits are important in order to educate people in uh, let's call this uh, out this new alphabet age. And we need to teach uh, new behaviours now and at an in, uh, really at a national and international level. And this is what I want to say. We have a few, we'll only have a future if we're able to restructure the ethical structure that will be our um, our model, a new model of behavior. So this future, Professor Dekirkova describes, let's see if we're able to kind of reconstruct this approach. Now we'll start talking about this uh, online, the approach of online civility, let's call it. What would you suggest is the kind of the path of education of uh, instruction that that we could be done in the next few years that could help us to make this kind of journey? So there's a lot of terms at play here. There's a, a theme tied to uh, understanding, understanding quite how the internet works, being aware of how social networks work, what happens if you're you know, if you you're on Instagram for ten minutes, if you uh, if you like certain posts, understanding what are who who uh, owns the the keys to this information, because uh, we looked earlier at the time in which uh, the internet was the the fountain of freedom. You know, with Obama, with the Arab Spring, that the, they were fueled by the uh, this new kind of freedom on the internet. Possibly in that moment, there was someone who quite rightly to to who was aware to the to the situation understood uh, quite how he understood how to use technology for the better, how to use the internet better, and now we're in a, a situation of um, where we we talk about this definition that I like a lot of neo-feudalism almost with these uh, great these immense companies the likes of which we're, we're almost citizens of because on the other hand because they give us some incredible services that we like a lot and they, they give us a, a series of information of, a, of, of content let's think about the big on-demand channels where we go and watch our TV series our films so the first step is to understand how does this all work. 
and to to move to a a wider level of knowledge in terms of where we are now to understand the world better the other big theme is the uh, the idealizing of the of the term disintermediarization we're in an era in which we are there's no intermediaries anymore there's a uh, intermediate bodies and entities at their lowest levels of popularity they ever have you know that we've ever recorded uh in these these days now instead we we're, we're, we're trusting this uh intermediarization to others but these people who don't have um uh, the obligation uh, to be non-profit in fact they they on the quite on the other hand they profit off of their role now these new intermediaries we trust we go back to the idea of who who do i trust to be an intermediary online so you know we've imagined some bodies that are worthy of our trust the idea of you know the idea of trust opens a a whole other discussion here it's it's very interesting what we we spoke about earlier about what happened in Milan and in schools about how when we, we trusted technology to, to overcome this moment of crisis how much faith do we have at the moment in in politics in our in administrators in schools what's the level of kind of the median level of faith in politics in uh, in political parties, in mayors, which you know have almost become rude words now. You know, I, I see you sweating at the mention of them. But you know, it, it's it's worth discussing. We, if we we talk about when we there's a lack of intermediaries, which it's not true. There's simply other intermediaries that maybe we don't see. And on this, Roberta Cocco talking, you know, about what we're going through right now, if you can help us to understand, you know, given that intermediary bodies now are going through this crisis that we've just heard, of, that uh, Gentina has just told us about, what can, you know, even companies do to, to push forwards this, uh, this route to awareness? Which, uh, we need education in it, obviously, about this digital age. What, what's being done now or you've already told us a bit now but what do you think's uh, going to be done in the next few years institutions can't really do something they have to do something and we we all understood this in particular in cities and all cities you know national and international level one of the the small positive aspects of this uh these few, few positives of these terrible people, uh, this terrible time, has been the union between cities. We've uh, we've all come together immensely because we've all been faced with the same problems now, and uh, the internet was our was a tool for us. Like Gentina said, this idea of uh, of awareness, awareness which has to be held by institutions as well. What I've seen in my career towards. Uh, working for the Milan municipality is that every project of every digitalization project we developed needed to be uh, supported by education internally of, of people and you know of, uh, of civil servants so that they could understand what they're doing what they know how to work it and that they understand its value to then be able to uh, to propose to a defeat uh, to spread it to other citizens so the theme of awareness is something that needs to be seen you know for a full 360 for as many people as possible another theme i'd like to quickly touch on even you know having seen the the theme of this year's meeting is how can us adults and even us as institutions work so that we can that building trust should go through a a, a, a a trial of its own value what can i offer to my citizens to the public uh, a service that solves a problem for them that's helpful to them 
and the whole technological component, uh, I've kind of developed it myself, let's say. And this service reaches a person or the document or the information, the authorization to do something they were looking for. This helps me definitely to, uh, to build trust as a, an institution, but definitely it helps people to, to have more trust in the digitalization and in the digital world. It happened to us at the beginning when we were starting to push for uh, more digital um, certificates and ID documents. People would s often still come uh, with the a document they'd printed themselves asking themselves if it was true. Asking us if it was uh, still accepted now. And still it was it was paradoxical. They, they'd made the effort to uh, to print something, to understand something, and yet they still kind of queued up at the town hall because they were afraid that that document wasn't accepted anymore. This makes us understand a lot. This should serve as a lesson. We have to let people trust us, not through words, but with something valuable that we offer them. I'll just briefly close here, conclude here with something. It's the, the idea of help for young people. We need to, to help young people to have the, the courage, even through social media and the digital networks, to be themselves, to understand what's the right and wrong information they see, to not just stop uh, at, at wider titles, you know, we know these a lot, but to, to go to really deepen their own understanding, because a risk of uh, that social media can have is that of we get used to uh, too super. The information is too superficial. I just read the the title and I've already understood everything. I read the headline and I already know everything. That's definitely not the case. Sadly, we need to help our young people to have the the courage to educate themselves and to to then uh, make an informed decision because making informed decisions is what makes us free and only when we're free whatever our intentions may be only that's when we can make uh, decisions uh, Roberta Cocco ci porta su okay well uh, starting from this point that we've left off with uh, to the th topic of trust for the world of journalism is there trust or is there the desire to want to be heard at all costs? If we don't find the right way to go about this in the next couple of years, what might the future of our democracy be? As, of course, this depends on uh, information that must defend it. Well, I think, uh, base, going on of what Roberta Coco said, there are a couple of points uh, that answer this question. The first thing I would say is the role of uh, individual cities. Each city is naturally a place of openness and sharing of knowledge. And if I was to say whether today uh, are we the future of intermediary bodies? Uh, these intermediary bodies are very challenged. Despite all these challenges, they, uh, individual cities have a, an extraordinary future as policies of uh, attraction. And Another point which I think answers the question perfectly is the role of intermediaries. It is true that we uh, have new intermediary forces, but we cannot tolerate intermediaries that, ha that bring no value. In particular, in Italy, we could talk about the uh, certificate of existence, which certifies that I exist, which is quite superfluous. It's uh, absurd. When we try to explain this to foreigners, they don't believe us. 
But it's true that the media, newspapers, information is what drives this. How can the media bring value today? This is the question. Social media is the place of fake news, rumors, and in a certain sense, they're like uh, a mixer of a lot of information. It depends like a, a, like a fan, whatever I, a blender, if I throw uh, bad things into that blender, then I obviously I get a disaster. So all media should start asking itself questions because some people think that the our uh, society is our economy is the economy of attention if we think that the objective of media is to throw out news and not build use this to build use these platforms to build then we don't have a very uh, bright future instead if we try to use the opportunities that our society and that our time brings and regarding what we said uh, in terms of the difficulties that digital technology has brought us let's try and uh, distance ourselves for a minute from economical consequences. But when we take home a digital appliance, a phone, we, it's not like we open, we don't open the instructions manual. We don't realize that someone has made that phone, the immediate experience of that phone, completely automatic and instantaneous. to the point that it doesn't require such a complicated device, doesn't require an instruction manual. If you don't follow uh, the flux of information, the influx of information on social media and on other kinds of media, and where the main point is to try and attract our attention, the main point is to realize that one of the most important paradigms of our 20th century doesn't, is, is no longer necessary anymore. This is important because the scarcity is no longer, doesn't have to do with information anymore, but has to do with our lack of attention. This is where the real lack is. And we need to understand among this, among this noise what is actually of value. If our media began to use digital technology in, in all its potential, even if they continued to make paper newspapers, but paper newspapers that are able to explain and uh, explain in detail certain things, uh, they would be much more successful than the media that is circulating today. And then I would like to say, uh, it, of course, awareness, responsibility is very important, but those the phones that we bring in our pockets every day, the Reagan, when So all the computers, the computers that Ronald Reagan had in his office in 1980 are less powerful than the phones that we bring in our pockets every day. Of course, if we're playing Candy Crush all day on our phone, we're not really doing a great service to, our, to ourselves and we're not r using this superpower that has been entrusted to us to its maximum, to the, it, it, the maximum of its potential. And you said that within that object, you saw also 
the possibility perhaps to find certain solutions unorthodox solutions to uh, the problems in Afghan Afghanistan. Yes, I think you all know at the end of this ultimatum, the 31st of August, whoever uh, we are able to bring home uh, or bring away from Afghanistan uh, will be able to be brought away. But uh, of course, we don't have that much time and all of you know what's happening in Kabul at the moment. One of the things that digital technology has taught us is that a community is no longer based on eth ethnicity or uh, territory. It has to do because, of course, we can be in, in contact and touch with people from other countries. We can, we can share the same values and share the same knowledge. If European states started reasoning along these lines, they might say, well, you know, Mr. Mm, from the Taliban, we will give citizenship, German, English citizenship, French citizenship, to all the people who we wanted, that we want to bring outside of Afghanistan, that we weren't able to bring outside of Afghanistan before the 31st of August. I would say that if all of us of all of us managed to get a passport through our phone, maybe those who will stop them might think twice because they're stopping effectively a European citizen. So even our states, our nation states, could also use this as a huge source uh, and uh, use it for all its potential. Thank you. So our time has run out, but the debate has given us many, many new uh, points to think about, to try and imagine what I would say I could would say a good life might look like in this digital era. And of course, it's a question of position of our, our the gaze that we have on ourselves and on technology. And I have, what could we do to do things differently in terms of geopolitics, as we heard an example here and using technology in that sphere. This, we, if we had the same uh, gaze that Copernicus and Galileo had on their inventions, uh, realizing that uh, the earth did not work as they had thought and they therefore needed to change their perspective. So this era is obliging us to change our perspective in the same way. And tonight we have helped each other to mm, focus on what points we need to work on. Now the responsibility is in our hands because the uh, extremely powerful device, more powerful than Reagan's computer, uh, is in our pockets. Let's think about that, what we can do with these amazing devices. I'd like to thank uh, Derek de, de Krakowa, uh, Roberta Cocco, uh, Massimo Russo, and Enrico Gentina for their contribution this evening. And uh, we, well, we say goodbye to them with a round of applause. Thank you. So the meeting is coming to an end. And as you know, the meeting is made by volunteers, is con built by volunteers and the contribution of many people. So I think it's important to remember and remind each other that at the end uh, and during the meeting, it is possible to uh, help the meeting. To this year, donations of people who, su who support the meeting help um, the welcoming house in uh, Kampala, uh, Rose Buzinja's uh, initiative, which helps people uh, in Uganda to find a new home. And your donation will go towards this initiative.
Thank you very much and have a good rest of the meeting.